All right, tonight I'm not going to keep you long. Um, I'm going to just get right into the, the word. I know we have baptism and youth cafe to, tonight. And I just want to get a little transparent. God's been dealing with me about some stuff. God gives us promises in life. And he says, whether it's promises to deal with purpose or anointing or it's it's promises that deal with our kids or it's promises that deal with, with, with healings. God gives us promises in the Bible. And or if it's in our personal study time, God begins to reveal something to us. Or whether it's a, it's a word that is given over us, he gives us this promise. Uh, but there's a pattern in the Bible that whenever a promise is, give, is, is given, that there is a time span in which before we see the fulfillment. There is a time that we are in waiting. And it's in this time of waiting that, 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 that discouragement can, can set in and doubts can set in and questions can, can set in. And a lot of people, this is the time in waiting that they begin to doubt. Maybe I never really heard a word or maybe that pastor was off or maybe the scripture doesn't apply to me. And it's, it's in this time of waiting that, 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 that the enemy really tries to come and turn us away from the word that at one time we knew God gave us. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. We're going to go to Psalms 119, uh, verse 49 through 56. Let me read it real quick, and then we'll get into it. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I kept your precepts. Heavenly Father, I praise your name, Lord. God, I pray that every word that comes out of my mouth is directed by you, Lord. I don't want to miss a step. I don't want to say anything that causes discouragement or confusion. I don't want to say anything that is not orchestrated by you, Father. Let your word come alive. Let, let your word inspire and motivate and, and correct, Father. I praise your name. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that me, we may know what is the hope of your calling. And in the name of Jesus, amen. Throughout the Bible, this pattern is seen in which a promise is given and there is a time of waiting before it comes to fruition. Abraham is given a promise. He says you are going to have a son and, and in your old age. And in, in, in Romans, he said he considered himself dead. Uh, uh, Sarah's womb was dead. But then Abraham, in this time of waiting, he decides to take it into his own hands. And he takes Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, and, and he tries to uh, produce God's promise on his own. And then Ishmael is born. You jump down to Joseph. Joseph is given a promise through a dream. But whenever he is given the promise, he does not go straight from the, pro the promise to the palace. He goes to the prison first. There is a testing here in Psalms 105. It says, referring to Joseph, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. You go to David. David is out tending the sheep out in the field. Samuel comes to Jesse and is going to anoint one of Jesse's sons. For, to be a king, and he goes through the sons and said, do you not have another son? And Jesse says, I've got one more, but it's just David. So then David comes, and he, be, and he gets anointed king, but David doesn't go from that time of anointing to the palace also, but he has to go back to the field. Mary herself is given a promise that out of her womb will come the Messiah, the, 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 the king. But she does not see the fulfillment of the promise. As a matter of fact, Jesus has to go to the cross before Mary ever sees him glorified. Over and over and over again, you see the pattern of a promise is given, but the fulfillment does not happen right away. There is a time of waiting. 
my dad or pastor has preached the sermon. There is the promise, the process, and the product. It is in this, pro- is, is in, in this process that there is a time of waiting. In that time of waiting, sometimes we doubt, sometimes we question, sometimes we ask God what is going on. Give me some sort of understanding. Why am I not seeing the fulfillment of the promise? It is not necessarily wrong to have these questions. It is not wrong to ask God what is going on. Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, if this is, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be be done. He's saying, Father, I don't know if I can go through the process. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't don't know if I've got what it takes. But nevertheless, your will, not my will, be done. Jesus is hanging on the cross with, with nails through his hands and nails through his feet, and he cries out, Father, why have you forsaken me? He is in the midst of his process, and he begins to question, God, why am I in the middle of this? But in the middle of the process where he differs from a lot of us is that he does not stop the process. To Pilate, he says, you do not take my life. I give my life freely. The Bible also says that any time he could have called 10,000 angels down to take him off of the cross. He did not do it because he knew that if you stop the process, you stop the promise. The process, the process, the process. There's something that has to happen in order for us to grab hold of the promise. That's what this text is saying. Remember the word that you gave your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. He's saying, you gave me a word, you gave me a word, you gave me a word, and I have hoped on this word. I have thought about this word in the night. You told me my kids would be saved, and and I'm holding on to the word that you gave me. I am hoping on this word. You said my body would be healed, that my mind would be healed, and I'm holding on to the word. He then goes on in verse 50. He says, this has been my comfort and my affliction. Your word has given me life. Now, this is an interesting little area here. So in verse 50. 49, he says, do not, he says, remember the word upon which you've caused me to hope. 51, he says, the word has given me life. Whenever you study the original Hebrew text, these two instances are two different words. The word that is used for word in verse 49 is the Hebrew word daba. The one that is used in verse 50 is the Hebrew word imra. The first one is a spoken promise. The second one is the literal word command of God. In Thayer's dictionary, he even says the Torah. So what this is saying, the same word combination is used in Psalms 105, referring to Joseph, as I said earlier, when he says, until his word came came to pass, the spoken promise, the word of the Lord or the command tested him. You see, we, we, we receive a promise from God, a hope that is with the prophetic that tests our faith. But in the midst of our faith being tested, the law tests our character. That's what's going on here. He's saying, in this Psalms, he's saying, you gave me a word and I am holding on to that word. But in the midst of me seeing it happen, your word, the law, the commands of God is testing my character. The rest of this section of Psalms 109, he goes back and forth. He says, remember, between verses 49 and 56, I think, he says, remember three times. I'm laying a foundation here. He says, remember, first time, he tells God, remember what you spoke to me. The other two times, he wants God to remember how he had kept his precepts, how he had kept his law. So we see in verse 50, this is my comfort and my affliction. Your word has given me life. See, it's this, it's this word that gives me life. This word gives me purpose. This word 
gives me healing. This word gives me guidance. This word keeps me going when I don't think nothing else can. What is life? Life is strength, energy, the ability to keep going, saying this word is what has given me life. I am hoping upon the spoken word, but if I lose track of this word, I lose life. He then goes on to say, the proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I have remembered your judgments of old and have comforted myself. We get surrounded. We give, God gives us a promise. Let's say, for instance, about a child coming back to God. But all your friends and family see that they're still shooting up dope. They're still lying. They're still sleeping around. But you know God gave you a promise. So we get surrounded by people that talk down to what we know God has spoken to us. And he says, I don't turn aside from your law. I don't, I don't turn aside from what you have spoken to me. I, don't turn, I still live my life. I'm still nice to people that speak down upon me. I still praise God when I don't feel like praising. I still tell the truth when I can tell a lie. I keep living life how I'm supposed to live life. Then he says, and I comforted myself. How many times and we're going through something and we want somebody to pray for us. We want, you know, I'd, I'd do better if somebody would give me a word of encouragement. He says, I comforted myself. Sometimes you got to pull your own self up by your own bootstraps and say, I don't care if nobody else follows God. I don't care if nobody else praises God. I'm going to keep praising. I comforted myself when I was surrounded by the proud, when I was surrounded by people that didn't believe in me, when I was surrounded by people that kept throwing my past up in my face. I said, I don't care. I'm going to keep serving God. I comforted myself. That's, that, that's what David is, is, is what he's writing here. It says, indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage. In the house of my pilgrimage, I remember your name in the night. O oh Lord, I keep your law. Indignation. That word means a fiery anger. We look at what's going on around us in the world. It can be discouraging. It can make us downright mad. Evil provokes anger in the eyes of God. And if I have a heart for what, for the heart of God, evil should anger me also. But anger, if it does not lead to confrontation, it is nothing. And I'm not saying confrontation is getting in somebody's face. But remember, we don't war against flesh and blood, but we war against spirits. So when I say evil causes anger, I'm not necessarily saying converting, confronting a person. I'm saying confronting, confronting the evil in the name of Jesus. How many times do we see people walk in depressed and, and, and who have anxiety and we sit back there and watch instead of saying, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get off of this person. We have to confront the evil. He says, your, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord. Again, he says, I remember. In the night, in the night, in the dark times, whenever... I didn't think I could make it. When I was on my own cross crying, Father, why have you forsaken me? When I was in my own garden the night before, and I said, God, can I not go through this? He says, I remembered your name in the night. You see, there's, there's, he transfers here. Uh, in the text, he goes from saying, I kept your precepts. And here said, I remember your name. I remember your name. and What is the name? Whenever uh, Moses said to God, what should I tell them who you are? He said, I am that I am. The word Jehovah literally means the one that causes to become. What he's saying is I didn't forget that in the night hour I could call upon your name and you could speak things that are not as if they are. You could say let there be and something would become. I remember your name in my darkest hour, God. I look to you. 
in the night, in the night. He says, your statutes have been my songs, have been the thing that I praise with. We look at commands as a cross and as a sacrifice. When sometimes the commands and obedience is our praise. God, if you don't command me, if you don't chastise me, the Bible says that you don't even love me. We are told to do things and we, we make choices that are disobedient and then we go through situations and we get mad at God. But he's just proving that he loves you. For those that he chastises, he loves He's trying to get us closer to him. He's trying to get us to the position to grab hold of the promise. He then goes on to say, this has become mine because I kept your precepts. What is he saying? Now, this is a hard truth here. For a lot of people, this is, this is a hard principle because... At the beginning of this section, he just said, remember the word upon which you have caused me to hope. And then he says that your word has given me life. I've got hope. I've got life. I keep praising you. And when I, when I don't feel like it, I remembered your name in the night. Why? Because I was obedient. When I was reading through commentaries on this particular verse, Multiple commentaries pose the question, what was the this? In King James Version, it says, I, this is what I had because I kept your precepts. What was the this? One commentator began to say, you can fill it in with whatever you want. Your healing because you were obedient. Your freedom because you were obedient. The anointing because you were obedient. Our obedience does not earn us anything. But what obedience does is it puts us in a position to receive. If the blessings of God are a water fountain that's falling right on the other side of this pulpit. And God says, look, if you can get behind here, you're going to receive your blessing. But you've got to obey. This is where the blessings are falling. Obedience does not earn it to come to me. Obedience simply puts me in the position to receive. Reap and sow consequence. If you like science, Newton's law of physics. Every action has an equal or greater reaction. What it's saying is when your action is obedience, the reaction to that action is going to be blessing. I have this because I kept your precepts. God has given me promises. And I'll be quite honest. I'm in a waiting period myself right now. I'm crying, God, when? When, 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 when? I'll be real transparent. I don't have a problem with it. A lot of you guys know my past. Strung out on heroin for multiple years, back and forth to prison. And when I was in prison, I didn't have a lot. There was some praise and worship. There was some of that, but it's not the same. All I had was the word. I woke up with the Bible. I went to sleep with the Bible. It was the word all day. Not trying to brag on myself, but... During this time, I woke up at 3.45 in the morning, spent an hour and a half in Strictly Word. From 5 to 7 every day was Strictly Word. I fed on Word all day long. I worked in the chapel, was constantly reading other authors in Word all day long. I have nothing today, whether it's the house or a wife or a baby to be or happiness or freedom, I have none of it without the Word. If you hear me speak, I am extremely word heavy. I believe there should be daily time in the word every day. Not because I've just been raised in church and it's why it's been put into my head, but because I am the result of the word setting somebody free. This is just not a theory to me. This has become my reality. And so God gives promises and 
I still have cravings to this day where I wake up and the first thought in my head is, God, I want to get high. When you do drugs for as long as what I did it, your body craves it. Your body wants it. It's not just a mental thing or just say no. If you think it's just saying no, you really don't know what you're talking about because your body longs for this substance. And what it is, is it is your sinful flesh trying to tear you down from the blessings of God. That's all that it is. A word was given to my mom about me saying that there will be a day that he will not even smell like the fire. Referring to when Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego went into the furnace and they came out and they said they didn't even have the smell of smoke. There was a word given that said, I will walk out of this and I won't even have the craving or the smell of smoke on me. And I'm waiting for that day, but is it here yet? No. So what do I do? Do I give in and say, okay, screw it, God. I've asked and I've asked and I've asked. I've been obedient. I've been obedient. I have carried weights on my shoulder of service day in and day out. And you can't simply answer a prayer. And then he takes me back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass from me. Jesus had to go to the cross, so why shouldn't I? In order for Jesus to grab hold of his promise, he had to go into a grave. He had to go through some stuff. So I grab hold of that truth. God, if I'm obedient, God, if I try, and we, we mess up, we make mistakes. I look at the pattern of your life. What is the pattern? One-time instances don't really bother me. Right? If you show a pattern of inconsistency, a pattern of disobedience, a pattern of thinking wrong, that's when you need to evaluate yourself. If you show a pattern of obedience and you're walking in obedience and you make a mess up, I can understand that. I step back and say, okay, that was just a weak moment. But if you have a pattern of disobedience, you need to reevaluate something. There, there, there is a deeper issue here. Whenever you're looking at somebody and they make a mistake, don't be quick to judge. Look at the pattern. Have they been nice and strong time after time and time after time, and they slipped up and had a mistake? The Bible says when your, father, when, when your brother falls, to pick them up. What is their pattern? Look at the heart issue here. What's the pattern? And so I say, God, I want to come after you with all that I am. And to be quite frank, I might never see a day on earth without a craving. But I know one day I will. You see, we speak of they didn't get healed and they didn't get healed while they were, well, I'm sorry, but if they were a Christian, they're going to be healed one day. I mean, no, no matter, you see, we, got, we live our lives, I, I need something to use as a, as a metaphor here. I'm sorry, give me one second. Does anybody know who Francis Chan is? I apologize. This just came into my head. And if you're in Relentless, you know that sometimes things just pop into my head. All right. This is not original. This is from Francis Chan. From the beginning of this core to the end is eternity. Okay? This is eternity. Eternity is a concept that we can't understand. The silver part on this end is our life. We live so consumed and worried about this part, losing track of what's going on here. We say a person didn't get healed because we don't see it in this part. But what we don't understand is that they're living this part completely set free and healed from every disease and every mind battle that they ever faced. Why don't we live our lives 
instead of building up treasures and homes and money and finances in this time, this area? What happened if the entire church lived every day more focused on this area? Then what would happen? What would happen is we wouldn't be able to fit enough people in this place. What would happen is we would see people set free every service. We would hear healings every service. If we would, lay, if we would live our lives God and eternity focused, that's what would happen. So we wait. We wait and we wait. What do we do? At the beginning of this, I said, remembered in this section of verses in the text is stated three times. David first says, God, you remember what you said to me. And then he says, God, remember that I'm living this out as best that I can. And that's the question I pose to you. Could you sit here and say, God, remember that I'm trying my best. Remember that I'm living by your precepts. Remember. Remember. If God remembered your yesterday, could you say that I followed your precepts? If you told God to remember your last week, would it look like you obeyed his commands? And I'm not necessarily talking about the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about that person that you sit next to at work that God said to witness to and you said no. Or that time that you were in the service and God wanted you to lift your hands as a symbol of surrender, but you said no. Or that time that God asked you to wake up early before you went to work to spend some time in his word and you said no. I've done it. I've done it recently. I was telling my dad today, this time change thing, I got to be getting old. Because this time change thing messed me up, man. I can't get up for nothing anymore. But that's neither here nor there. If you told God, remember my yesterday, what would it look like? What would it look like? I'm coming to a close. I don't really have an altar call for tonight. This week, I want you to wake up every morning with this metaphor in your mind. That I'm not living my life based on this. I'm living my life based on this. This is what I'm concerned about. Every day, wake up and say, God... Give me the clarity to hear your voice and the courage to obey. I honestly believe God gave me this because there's people here that are in the middle of your waiting period. And you're wondering, when am I going to see the fulfillment? In all honesty, I don't have a clue. But I do know. That it is impossible for God to lie. And I do know that he said, if you follow my precepts, if you follow my word, if you live this word out with all that you got, the promise will come to fulfillment. You just got to keep on and keep on and keep on. If you will bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I praise your name, Lord. God, I, it, it, it is a privilege to be able to step into your presence. It is a privilege to be able to speak your word. It is a privilege to be considered a son or a daughter of you. Father, this week as it's coming up, and as we're trying to walk out this Christian life as true disciples of you, and it gets hard, Father, I pray that you give us strength. I pray that you give us clarity. I pray that you keep us walking this out in the way that it's supposed to be walked out, Father. God, there is none like you, Father. 
And in the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit of confusion. I bind any spirit of discouragement. I bind any spirit that would come in and stop us from achieving what you have called us to achieve. In the name of Jesus, you have no place in the child of God. You have no place in in this place. You have no place. In the name of Jesus, I bind anything that would stop us or for not allowing the word that was given tonight to take root and grow. You are a mighty God, Father, and I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your healing, for your word, for your promises. You are a mighty God. And, Father, I thank you for what is about to take place, for the baptisms, Father, for the symbol of us dying to self and living to you, Father. I thank you for the truth behind baptism and what you did on the cross. And I thank you. And in the name of Jesus. Amen.